So the topic is quantum thermodynamics, and as uh, as Zhenya told, it's kind of a <clears throat> uh, interesting uh, direction, uh, which is somehow one could even say that it's a little bit uh, uh, and uh, that they're like uh, quantum uh, quantum physics and thermodynamics are are things that are usually not. Uh, considered to be so close to each other. Here, I, I, I try to, to, to show that uh, one can do some quite interesting experiments in, in this area. First of all, of course, I have to, I have to uh, introduce what I mean by quantum thermodynamics. And, and, and all my lecture will be about quantum thermodynamics in, in superconducting circuits and in superconducting hybrid circuits, partly. So in the first part, there is a lot about this sort of hybrids with superconductors and, and, and usual metals uh, uh, where such as electrons transport heat. In the second part, I will uh, talk a lot about uh, qubits, superconducting qubits, and how they can be kind of harnessed in, in, in this field. So <clears throat> this, is, this is kind of the outline, uh, uh, just some sort of definition. Uh, then I, I spent some time on, on what I could call a toolbox. I will tell you about uh, what are the <clears throat> principles of, of, of uh, thermal uh, transport experiments, uh, how we can really make observations. Thermometry is one of the key issues there, of course. Then I go more to the physics about quantum heat transport theory and experiments. Of course, experiments are the, are the, are the um, heart of the of the lecture but there's a lot about interesting things also from on the level of co concepts and and then i i i, I move on to the <clears throat> topic of uh, open quantum systems so this is a wonderful uh, setup having a superconducting qubit uh, for example which is connected to the external world so it's it's you cannot imagine anything better probably uh, to, to be as a model system for an open quantum system. Open quantum system meaning that you have a quantum system which interacts with its environment and, and, and behaves in a sense a non hermitian way. Uh, it's, a, it's a field, of course, which has been theoretically addressed and discussed for a long time, open quantum systems. <clears throat> and then I tell about our experiments in this field. And, and final, final topic today is quantum calorimetry where, where we have Kind of uh, ambitious plans and 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 some progress uh, in the in the past year or two. So uh, indeed about definitions. So <clears throat> uh, for me, this uh, thermodynamics of quantum circuits means uh, all the thermodynamics in 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 quantum regime means that that we do things which are common to to the traditional uh, thermodynamics. Uh, but uh, as an extra ingredient, we have we have uh, working substances or let's say elements in in in, in the system which which are are maybe sandwiched or connected to to the heat baths, which in this case are really quantum maybe quantum two level systems qubits or or more complicated quant quantum circuits. So so maybe quite a lot of time today I will spend on, on what is shown here on the left, which is kind of the this basic uh, experimental um, uh, scenario to, to have, uh, well, sometimes I talk with one heat bath, but, but two heat baths gives us already a kind, kind of a very interesting playground because you can see how heat is transported as usual from a hot bath to the cold bath, but now it is mediated by the quantum, quantum element here. And, and then this quantum element, as we know, qubits can be controlled by magnetic fields or electric fields. So fluxes, um, gate voltages, then we can, we can really see how this heat is, heat is kind of modulated by, by, by these uh, properties of this system here. More in, interestingly even, uh, but still a little bit elusive from the experimental point of view is, is the scenario where you can make really active elements namely having refrigerators. So uh, you, can, you can imagine the same system, but now you would do work uh, actively, like changing the magnetic field or, or electric field here in time domain, so that you can pump heat out from the cold, 
cold heat bath to the hot heat bath. So this is exactly the, the same thing as in a classical thermodynamics, but now um, facilitated for, um, hopefully with a with the quantum, quantum element here. And then the reverse of that would be a heat engine, quantum heat engine, where again, we have these two heat baths and then heat flows again from hot to cold, but part of this, part of this heat is uh, transformed into work. So we don't have at the moment even a clear um, physical realization in mind how, how this would be done, but uh, on the concrete level, but th this is of course something which is just a reverse of the refrigerator is the heat engine. So yeah, so this is a bit of a repetition. So, <clears throat> so I will spend quite a lot of time looking at heat transport through, through a quantum system. Uh, and as I said, <clears throat> as the second, uh, second element here is the, the colorimetry and bolometry. So <clears throat> it, is, it is important to, to really <clears throat> uh, also study systems where we have just a single kind of observer coupled to the, to the heat bath so that, uh, but, um, that it could work as a very sensitive detector of, of, uh, of uh, heat currents, even down to the level where one can, one can monitor single events in form of uh, single photons. And, and the important element in this case is the, it's a thermometer, of course, because you, you want to see the energy that is carried by these photons or whatever carriers and, and then when it's absorbed to this uh, tiny element, then you need a good thermometer there. And how is this is still on the very introductory level, I will go into the details of all this. So you will see these things again, but here, uh, <clears throat> here are some uh, realizations that we have in the group at the moment for, for this kind of a um, experiment, just, just to give you a uh, first idea of, of how this connects to what is already known probably from the earlier lectures in this series, namely that <clears throat> you, you can have a uh, superconducting qubit, uh, which is then uh, uh, in this case, it's like this x type qubit or trans type qubit, the most common qubit is essentially these days. And, and it, it can connect via these uh, co-planar wave uh, resonators, which act as harmonic oscillators or effectively, it connects, uh, it connects to the um, heat bath. And in our case, this heat paths, they are essentially, they are almost invisible here in this uh, picture, but what they are, they are these small elements of metal here at the end of, this, uh, of these resonators on the left and right. So in this example, for example, you can see that there is this uh, few micrometers long normal metal element connected to these superconducting uh, resonators. And this normal metal, metal element acts as a absorber of energy. So, so the quality factor of these resonators is highly reduced because of the presence of this, of this element here. And indeed, this, they, they act as, as, as heat baths here. And then the important thing here is that we have these probes, which I will describe in a second, which then detect the temperature changes in this, in this very same uh, element here. So we measure the electronic temperature and the electrons are coupled to the phonon bath and the electrons are the in interesting thing here. Another <clears throat> uh, example which is coming in this lecture is very similar, but let's say it's only one half of this uh, element, what is on the top here. So we can have a qubit which we will excite or we'll manipulate somehow, and then it will release its energy because of the coupling to this, uh, to this heat bath. And we, we aim to measure with a very, very sensitive uh, thermometer, the energy that, that, that has been stored first in the qubit when it is absorbed in, the, in, the, uh, in this absorber element. So I'll come back to all of this uh, later. But now about the principle of this, uh, uh, of this measurement. So, so one can, in principle, one can, if you talk about measuring the energies or, uh, or, or, or heat in general, one can categorize them in two, two different classes. So one can talk about bolometry and colorimetry in a sense. So <clears throat> what is meant by bolometry traditionally is that you have a heat current which is uh, impinging on this uh, absorber here, which can be this uh, small piece of metal that I showed. And, and if this is a continuous flow of energy, like a continuous flux of photons absorbed in this, uh, in this element here, 
then the overall temperature of this absorber, thanks to this weak coupling to the, to the for example, to the phonon bath, is changing. So you have a, you have like an Ohm's law, like uh, I'll come back to that also, but you have kind of a, uh, uh, imbalance that is or non-equilibrium that is created the temperature of this absorber is changing due to, in the presence of this heat so this is a technique that has been used already uh, already uh, centuries i could say uh, for measuring measuring the uh, uh, steady state heat currents so the temperature when you when you uh, uh, start to uh, start to expose this absorber it's it's first reaching its uh, certain value, and then, for example, it varies slowly in in in, in time or in 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 uh, for example in uh, sort of astronomical detectors. You can really uh, change the direction of, to which you are you are aiming this polarimeter. You can you can see how the overall power is changing in 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 in, in time, but but on, on the very long time scales usually. So it's like a DC measurement. But then the, the other very important uh, thing is the calorimetry, which is exactly the same element here. But then you aim not, aim not to measure this steady state flow of, 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 uh, of these uh, excitations of, of particles, but you, you measure, try to measure the single event. So, so when a single energy absorption, like a delta peak, like a energy uh, impulse is, uh, is uh, uh, occurring here, then the temperature of this absorber rises by by uh, by an amount which is given by the energy of this photon or or quantum divided by the heat capacity, and after that the temperature relaxes back to the bath temperature over a time scale, which is again given by this um, uh, heat capacity, but now divided by the thermal uh, coupling to the to the bath. So it's like an RC circuit in a sense. And, and then uh, this has been used a lot for, for example, for X-ray photon detection in the in in the in the past and, and presently also. But now here we aim to much much smaller energies because uh, uh, qubits have energies which are of the order of of uh, <clears throat> only uh, uh, like one Kelvin or even a smaller energies. So we are we are going a, a lot low in lower in, in energy. So so there there are a lot of challenges which are coming. So I already touched upon this. So this measuring heat currents is, of course, usually a, a, <clears throat> an issue in here. And, and one can make uh, just a, a, some sort of a cartoon here to, to tell that everything is similar to what you would think in, about uh, measuring uh, electric currents and electric voltages. So, so if you take, for example, a simple <clears throat> uh, RC or GEC um, circuit, and and yeah, and you uh, look at uh, what is the <clears throat> what is the voltage response to current or vice versa here. You can make a full analogy to this uh, to this um, uh, absorber or this uh, calorimeter element here in in a way that that you can see that the same equation in the linear regime is is uh, obeyed in the two cases. A simple equation where where you just replace the uh, charge current by the heat current. You replace capacitance by heat capacity. Temperature difference, you uh, oh, sorry, the voltage you replace by the temperature difference, uh, and, and 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 the conductance, electric conductance by thermal conductance. So, so uh, there's a full analogy, and you can analyze all this what I showed based on this very simple simple picture here. And then indeed, what you need is a thermometer which can measure the temperature, hopefully in a in a fast manner. So the workforce in our experiments is, is what we call a NIS thermometer. So, so this is something, a technique that is known already for several decades. And, and, and I, I would say that in our group, we have tried to make it uh, as well. It, it, it has been a, a topic of, uh, of um, improvement and development over many years. So <clears throat> the principle is extremely simple. Well, here is one of the thermometers. I mean, this is not a very small one. So here is a normal conductor, for example, and here is a superconductor. And then there's an overlap junction, tunnel junction. It's like a Johnson junction, but now between a superconductor and normal metal. So if you then make some sort of an energy picture of this uh, of this element here, you have what you have is this normal conductor. Then you have the insulating oxide barrier, and then you have a superconductor. Now, when you connect the voltage across this, this guy here, what happens is that, that at low temperatures, because there's a superconducting gap, 
there's no electrical current flowing through this thing until you come close to the energy gap of the of the <clears throat> of the superconductor. So you can shift these chemical potentials just by the voltage, and and at the at the moment that you come close to the gap, then you have a possibility to for electrons to tunnel through. And this leads to at low temperature to this current voltage characteristic, which is really really like a, in a well like you would call textbook or in a it's really a simple a simple model can and can tell everything there. So there is a measurement, the blue one, and then there is a red red one is the is the simple model at zero temperature sense. If you zoom this up, you will see this, I think, four orders of magnitude zoom IV. You can see that it still shows some sort of a uh, uh, blockade here, and then increase of current when you come to this gap voltage of the of the of the superconductor. For one Johnson, the 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 uh, actual uh, threshold here is about, is 0 0.2 uh, millivolts. Of course, there is some current already here at, at lower biases, as I will say so now. But anyways, so, so the, the, for thermometry, what matters is that this distribution here in the normal metal is, is our temperature. And when this gets broader here, then this current voltage characteristics gets uh, broadened. And the simple expression which uh, tells this mathematically is given here. If you take into account only the lowest order tunneling, you have this current voltage, which is, which is given by this simple expression. And, and the, there's a Fermi distribution in normal metal, and this is the uh, this is the density of BCS density of states of the superconductor. So, and this depends only on the temperature of the of the normal metal. So it's kind of a probe which, which you can put, you can tap the normal metal, and 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 the superconductor is just just like the holder of this probe. Uh, and it's only the gap here is is the important thing. No no temperature dependence comes into the play. And indeed. When you do this, uh, you when you look at this integral a little bit uh, at uh, in the at temperatures which are well below the superconducting transition temperature, you find that the current voltage characteristics of this are exponential like this. And if you take the logarithmic current of it, you find that that it's uh, the slope of this IV curve close to this gap is given by just the ratio of of and, uh, it's just given by inverse temperature. With, uh, with known uh, natural constants here. So in a sense, it's a primary thermometer. So, so doing the thermometry boils down to measuring, for example, <clears throat> uh, the slope, or more simply, you can just put a constant current through the junction and you can, you can monitor how the voltage is changing with temperature. Okay, so, so this, is, this is indeed what we do uh, uh, all the time in the laboratory. So this is uh, very standard and it's, you can see it in the experiments that I show. But, but this is, yeah, so this is good for bolometry. So when you, when you measure temperatures on a slow pace, you can just average the current, uh, average the voltage across the junction uh, when you keep uh, the, the junction at the constant, constant uh, uh, current, you can see the voltage changes there. But then you would like to also, if you do the calorimetry, you would like to measure the temperature faster. And we have, uh, we have worked on several different uh, variations on this, but maybe the most simple or archetypal one is this, to embed this uh, very same tunnel junction, the NIS tunnel junction, into a resonant circuit, kind of a tank circuit, LC tank circuit, lumped element LC tank circuit. And here we have the tunnel junction, it, its conductance. So when the conductance of the junction, which I showed already in, is in a sense, when it's changing with temperature, then you can see that the transmission in this, in this, uh, in this uh, S21 measurement essentially is, is changing. And at the end shown here, so what you see is that when you measure the full bias dependence of the, of the transmission here, you see that it's kind of uh, upside down uh, uh, conductance DIDV of, of, the, of this curve here, exactly for this reason that that uh, that uh, it's uh, the conductance here is what determines the transmission, and it in fact it is kind of there's an inverse uh, proportionality in, in some limit of the of the parameters, and and then of course this parameter also changes with temperature. So I mean uh, the conductance changes similarly with temperature as as the as uh, everything else there. So, so this is a basic thermometer, and it works quite nicely, as you see that 
at different bias points here, you can see that uh, that the uh, temperature versus uh, um, this S21 curves, they are more or less linear in, in, in some range of temperatures. However, at the lowest temperatures, we usually see some saturation. And this saturation has many different origins. One of the important origins is that it's, it's heavily biased this junction, so it's a dissipating point, and then you can you, you really um, uh, don't do kind of non-invasive thermometry. Also, the non-idealities of the junction play a role. So over the last few years, we have been working uh, on a uh, uh, on a, uh, a really uh, improved version of this, which is uh, which allows us to go to much lower temperatures. So this one, if you look, the saturation occurs somewhere around, typically around 100 millikelvin. In good cases, you can go somewhat lower, but anyways, it's 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 not so so easy. So what we are using now. This will come out in by an PhD thesis also, and there are uh, uh, there are some uh, recent uh, uh, recent publications on this. So what we do is that that we instead of having this usual NIS tunnel junction here, we also bring a superconducting probe in a direct contact without this tunnel barrier close to this uh, NIS junction. What is the consequence of this is that that if this is close enough then the superconductivity, the, the um, proximity of the, uh, of the superconductor makes this uh, normal metal slightly superconducting. Uh, and what we see in this case is that, that there is a, there's kind of a weak proximity supercurrent occurring at, in this chance. So now this has some very important features. It, it is non-invasive very large, to large extent because we don't buy apply any bias voltages and, and partly due to that, it operates also at much lower temperatures. So what we can do is we can optimize this. We can make this contact closer and closer. In, and I would say that in our best uh, realizations, we have seen that, that, that this, uh, this junction shows more or less linear temperature dependence uh, uh, down to the lowest temperatures of 20 millikelvin or even sometimes somewhat below. And then uh, we don't have an analytical form for how, how, the, how the conductance or this S21 there depends, but, but nevertheless, it shows pretty much linear dependence, which is easy for, for practical measurements. One more element on, on, the, <clears throat> on this uh, toolbox is the electron phonon coupling. So, so now, <clears throat> in order to really have measurements of heat currents, we need to measure the temperature, but then we need to relate it somehow to this uh, heat current. So we are back to the bolometry now. And there, the simple thing which arises directly from this uh, simple uh, equations that I wrote is that, that uh, essentially when you have the heat current, then um, in the linear regime, the, the heat current is equal to the thermal conductance of this absorber. Uh, uh, and, and then the produced temperature difference here. So it's like an Ohm's law here. Important thing, of course, here is that the heat capacity doesn't play a role because it's a DC property here. And so, uh, and, and, and one of the favorite systems in this respect is electrons to phonons because for usual metals, the electron phonon coupling is extremely well known. There, is, there are experiments on that by Michael Hookers and others already. Uh, uh, more than 30 years ago, almost 40 years ago, where they could, uh, they could, they could even uh, nail down the dependence to, to this T to power five dependence. So the, if there's an electron temperature, a phonon temperature, there's this, this heat current is, is scaling like this with the two temperatures. And the prefactor here is this is a material constant and this is the, this is the size of the absorber, the volume of the electronic absorber here. And then if you take a linear, uh, uh, linear, if you linearize this for small temperature differences, as we usually do, if you, if you measure some feeble small heat currents, then you have this thermal conductance, which is uh, written down here. So you just uh, take the derivative and, and this is the expression for the thermal conductance. Well, this T to power five law is very nicely followed. So this is data from, from our student, uh, previous student. 
uh, live in one where he could really show uh, all well this is one of the uh, experiments there are many of them so he showed also that this this follows really this t to power five law and the, the material parameter is also very well known for usual metals like copper so this is important because you you want to measure the heat current and you measure the temperature so you need to know it uh, the val absolute value and then that that's given via this thermal conductance Usually you can also calibrate this in the experiment by just putting a joule power to your system and, and checking how much the temperature changes. A last element in this toolbox uh, is that, uh, that uh, I, I want to show this, although I, I don't use this very much here, but it is something that we have worked a lot in this respect and it's relating of course to thermodynamics very, very closely is that, I, uh, that uh, this NIS junction is very active element, not only to prop the temperature, but also to manipul manipulate the temperature. So this tunnel junction can use also as a refrigerator. And, and the idea is extremely simple. Uh, so you just take the very same setup as before. I even use the same figure, I guess. So uh, here, when you bias this wall this close to this gap here, uh, you can see that when the current starts to flow at, at voltages, we said maybe just sl slightly below this gap, then only the electrons that are just above the gap here can tunnel out from the normal metal to the superconductor. So what does this mean? It means that the average energy in this, uh, in this uh, uh, normal conductor is decreasing and, and due to the internal relaxation in the, of the electron system in normal metal, this it forms an electron gas here with lower temperature than initially, thanks to this uh, tunneling. So, so in fact, if you assume that it's all the time staying at certain thermal distribution, these electrons, you can write down the, the cooling power of this kind of a junction. Similarly to what you write for the electrical current here, you just take here the energy uh, which, is, which is carried by these electrons here into account and integrate all, over all of them and, 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 and look at the district. So this is a very elementary kind of a, a landauer bitteker like uh, transmission um, calculation for, for the uh, heat current away from the normal metal. And this indeed, this produces at this optimal point, which is close to this gap, well, this is, produces a cooling power, which is proportional to temperature of this normal metal to three halves. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not only, uh, not, this is not fully academic thing. It's, it's, it has been studied experimentally. I will not go to it, but it has been studied experimentally a lot since the mid nineties and, and, uh, and in our experiments some um, uh, already long ago, we could uh, demonstrate that you can cool down this electron gas here from 300 millikelvin down to 100 millikelvin by, by, by this method. Okay, so let me then show you some recent things where maybe these elements of this uh, NIS junctions become quite uh, obvious before I go to, 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 um, to, to other stuff. So this is maybe the first uh, thing to, um, of, of, of recent experience in this. So I, <clears throat> uh, I, I hope uh, that people uh, have an idea what an, a single electron transistor is. So <clears throat> single electron transistor is a device where, where you have a small, <clears throat> small island, uh, in this case, normal island, and then it's connected to superconducting leads. It doesn't need to be a normal superconductor for the SET effects, but, but for this, for this uh, particular application, we need this uh, SINIS structure, like in the coolers that I was just telling. And then you put the uh, alternating gate voltage to this island. Okay, so, so the, in general, this SET uh, in, the, in kind of a steady state regime, it shows this kind of a stability diagram that you have uh, as in a, in a range of bias voltages across this SCT and then gate voltages here, which are just normalized here. You will see that there are these famous Coulomb diamonds, which, which tell the area where the number of charges on the island here is stuck to a certain value because of the high charging energy due to the small capacitance of the system. So there's a charging energy that competes with the, with the voltage and temperature sometimes. So the particular feature for this uh, uh, SIN structure is that, that these Coulomb diamonds, they extend due to the superconducting gap and they overlap uh, with each other. And this makes it possible that you have at finite bias voltage, you have no um, 
no current flowing through the device. So there's a forbidden range and, and, and it allows you to put a finite bias voltage, uh, but still no current flows in the steady state in, in, a, in a, a sta static conditions. But then you can put an alternating gate voltage here, which then <clears throat> the gate voltage, if it is changing in time, then you go from one stability uh, diamond to another, and the charge is transported through this device, one by one. Electron goes in one half of the cycle, it goes through the right junction to the lead, and in the second half, it comes from the left lead to the, to, to the island. And this way, you can produce a current which is equal to E times F. So the electron charge times the frequency of your operation. And this is, of course, interesting from the point of view of metrology, and already um, more than 10 years ago, we realized this device in practice. So, so we have, uh, we do this at different amplitude of, uh, amplitudes of this gate voltage here, sweeping across a number of, uh, of these uh, uh, stability diagrams, uh, stability uh, diamonds. Uh, and then you can, you can drag electrons with an integer number of electrons in each cycle through the device. So the current is really multiples of EF. And if you focus on the center of the first plateau, we can see that the current is really nicely following this E equals to EF, IE equals to EF. This is all experimental data that you see. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this is, there are still, I mean, uh, this is a heavy race in this metrology to find the best uh, realization. And, and I think this is not the one that is winning at the moment because the, the, the uh, remaining uh, errors which are on the level of 10 to minus five in this device are maybe hard to, hard to uh, uh, <coughs> suppress uh, sufficiently, but it's a very interesting device and, and, and it has some potential for metrology as well. But wh why I show it here is that, that uh, there is another possible uh, thing which is related to our thermodynamics here. Namely, this device which is shown here on the D and E, okay, this is again, a similar thing. So you can, we have these current plateaus at different, uh, at, 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 uh, at the, as a function of the amplitude of this gate uh, through this device, we again have a, a similar device here. But now concerning these <coughs> energies that I was talking to you about, then uh, we, can, we can see that this element can also be, be uh, 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 made into a frequency to power conversion. So, so, so this could serve as a, as a definition for what instead of ampere in the following way. So let's see, this is a symmetric structure. It, it looks a bit complicated, uh, but the principle there is that you have here the, this single electron transistor with normal island in the middle, then superconducting leads connected to it. And then you again have this gate voltage here. Now, when you change the gate voltage, it will again spit the electrons to the leads synchronously with the gate voltage. So now it's an interesting thing is that you can do it also now at zero bias voltage across the whole device here. And, and when you do that, what happens is that in each cycle, when you do the change this uh, uh, chemical potential of this normal island here by the gate, there's an electron going to the to the lead, when you go back down, the electron comes back to the, to the island. So if this would be just a one junction, it would work like this. So you put it in, out, in, out, in, and no net electrical current is transported. But what is interesting in this process is that, that even in the absence of this electrical current here, the, the, the amount of energy that you pump to the lead is more or less quantized thank, thanks to the thanks to this uh, uh, diverging density of states in the superconductor. So so now when we have a bolometer here, which measures how much energy do we inject to the lead here, we do exactly the way that I was explaining you how you do bolometry by these thermometers here by measuring the change steady state change of this temperature here. When we apply this gate, we will measure how much is the power that we inject to the lead. And this gives us the same pattern as before, but now not for electrical current, but for the heat current. So we have like, we have plateaus in, in, in heat current, which are multiples of, of, uh, of, uh, of delta now, not 
So the electron charge is replaced by, by, by the energy gap here in, in this expression. So, so we can see that, that there are multiples of, uh, of uh, uh, two delta F in fact, in, in, in this case. So this could serve as a, as a um, uh, principle for, for defining the what in, in, in experiments. Okay, so now this was the uh, kind of the <clears throat> more or less uh, qu uh, classical, uh, still quite classical uh, part of the, of the story. So now I go to some, um, some uh, more, uh, uh, I change a little bit gears, although you will see that all the measurements are done in the same manner at the end. So let's think about the uh, thermal transport in, in, uh, in, in uh, through some uh, uh, channels. This, this is very general, uh, this slide here. So let's suppose that we on the left, we have a reservoir with temperature. So this is again a two bath system. Reservoir with temperature TL, maybe chemical potential mu L, if we talk about uh, electrons, for example, then right reservoir TR mu R. Now, if there is a, uh, these are not, uh, I mean, if there is a, some sort of bias either in temperature or, or in, uh, in um, chemical potential that the particles are uh, wishing to go from one end to the other. <clears throat> and, and what governs this transport in a one dimensional channel is, is kind of a Landauer type expression where you can write down the, both, the, uh, both the particle current and the heat current in, in this kind of integral where, where you take the, either the velocity or the energy of the carriers here, uh, energy times velocity, and then the distributions of them in the two reservoirs. And, and, uh, and importantly, there's also this uh, transmission coefficient tau n, which tells how much the particles are scattered in this, in this channel area here. One can write this in a simpler form by, by uh, making use of the uh, relation of the energy uh, and, 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 and the velocity. Uh, and you can write these uh, this, uh, two expressions in, in, in this more simple way, which resemble what I already told, wrote to you for electrons in, 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 the, in, in this NIS junction. So you have the particle current, which comes from the dis difference of the distributions. And then you have the heat current, which comes from the difference in the distributions and the energy here. So now important case is, I mean, this can of course assume any values, these currents here, depending on how much it's scattering here. So if you have some uh, resistance, for example, there's this tau n is, is uh, if it's a diffusive wire, there you have uh, some uh, reflections and, and it, it does, it's, it's not uh, ballistic. I important case is the ballistic case, which can be realized in the experiments as well. So we take the ballistic case where each particle which wants to go through, goes through, the, uh, through this channel. So in this case, you, one can, I will not go through this derivation here, but you, you, you will see that, uh, that uh, the electrical current then will assume uh, an integer values, uh, integer multiples of E squared over H, or the conductor assumes integer uh, multiples of E squared over H. Similarly, and this is a very important thing here. If you do the same integral, for example, in this case of fermions for, uh, for the heat current, you will find out that, that the heat current also will be quantized in a sense. You will have uh, multiples of, uh, of the, what is called the quantum of thermal conductance uh, uh, as, as a thermal conductance through this channel. And this quantum of thermal conductance is, is uh, uh, given by this expression. So it's not really, well, uh, uh, if you are very orthodox, uh, in a sense, uh, you wouldn't call it a quantum because temperature appears there. But but this is this anyway is the the uh, the, the, the uh, rule on which they this uh, uh, what values this uh, thermal conductance can can assume. And the important thing is that this thing applies to any carriers, not only electrons. So so it has been for bosons the integral is easy to do. Also, you get the same answer. And even for onions, for, for uh, fractional charges, you, you can get the same answer. So there's, there's no, no uh, re, uh, relation to the statistics of the particles. You always have this, that, uh, that the thermal conductance is quantized in units of this. 
So electrical conductance was uh, 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 in a ballistic contact is known uh, for a long, long time. There are experiments uh, by Van West et al. Uh, and Varam et al. In, uh, already in the late 18, eight, uh, 1980s, where they could really see that the electrical conductance has these uh, uh, values. When you make a small constriction, this was done in a semiconductor case, uh, you can, when you have a ballistic contact between two reservoirs, you can see that the electrical conductance is quantized. So now, now the, concerning the uh, uh, heat conductance, the story is not that new. Uh, the first experiments of, um, on, on quantized thermal conductance were, were done on phonons in, uh, in, uh, by Keith Schwab at, uh, and others in, in, um, in year 2000, where they, they were measuring uh, this kind of a system where they had a silicon nitride platform here. This was connected with some very narrow bridges, uh, 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 optimized bridges, where the uh, uh, phonons can uh, propagate uh, ballistically through. And they found out that the, that the thermal conductance assumes a value at low temperatures, which is, which is just uh, uh, accountable by this, uh, by this uh, geometry having the four legs and, 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 uh, and, and, and in fact, four conducting modes in each of the leg. Uh, so they could have like 16 times the thermal conductance quantum at low temperatures. <clears throat> For electrons, the story is much newer. There are some experiments also in 1990s, but uh, not very quantitative yet. In, uh, in uh, Paris, in, uh, uh, I, they managed uh, in, uh, to do this uh, in the group of uh, Anand Thor and, 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 uh, and Frederick Pierre. They managed to measure this uh, by electrons in a, by, by, uh, by a setup, which I will not uh, discuss now in detail because I will show some similar experiments from our, our group later. But anyway, they could measure that, that this thermal conductance uh, is really quantized in, 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 this, uh, in this manner as, as expected. So our, now we are, uh, I, I'm coming closer to the physics of, of uh, qubits in a sense, because I said that this thermal conductance can, uh, can uh, uh, be present, uh, quantum can be present in, in, uh, for any, any carriers essentially. So we can take, take again a system where we have an absorber uh, it's, it can be again this electron absorber with, well, I, I forgot to mention that these electron absorbers typically have like uh, 1 billion or maybe uh, 100 million electrons there. So they it really forms a nice uh, distributed electron gas there. So, but this system now, if it's, it is coupled to the phonon path, as I told, but it can also be coupled to another environment electromagnetic. So, so this is a question, can we, can we see how this uh, heat is transported not only by electron phonon coupling to the, to the heat path here, but also possibly uh, via another channel, which is, which is the kind of uh, microwave photons that are, that are uh, emitted by, by these absorbers in, in, in here. And, and to start this story, I tell you a very mm, brief, uh, uh, very briefly, a, 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 a toy model, which in fact, Surprise is surprisingly close to the truth in, 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 in laboratory. So, so let's take this. Uh, you cannot imagine simpler setup as this one here. And this is what Johnson and Newquist used in their experience 100 years ago when they were, they were really uh, starting to understand the, the, the electrical noise and fluctuation dissipation theorem in that. Uh, so, so Suppose you have two resistors, R1, R2, at two temperatures, T1 and T2. And then we assume that it, they are connected by lines, which in our case are usually, they are superconducting lines so that they don't carry diffusive, diffusively heat between, uh, bet between the two. So, so the, the superconductors are perfect thermal insulators and, and especially aluminum works like this. The aluminum that we use in our experiments most. But the each of these resistors at temperature T1 or T2 uh, um, produces thermal noise. It produces thermal noise, which is, uh, which is, given, uh, uh, which is given by this uh, 
by this expression. I mean, here is uh, this is the quantum version for emission absorption noise, which is uh, which is uh, there's for positive frequencies and negative frequencies they they differ. We will probably come back to this point later. Uh, but if you take the uh, low frequency uh, low frequency limit of this, you will see that you you can see immediately that this gives you the the standard uh, two kbt times resistance, which is the Johnson Nyquist uh, noise of, of, of a resistor. If you take the both, um, if you or, or depending on the normalization, you can also if you're more familiar with four kbt times r, that you can also get it from here. So now, what the question is that how much do these resistors uh, uh, talk to each other in terms of heat transport? When, what one can do here, you can you can just write the simplest uh, Kirchhoff's law here. You find what is the uh, or say that the uh, uh, you can find what is the current produced by by a certain voltage by this resistor here. If it has voltage noise voltage V one, they are series connected resistors. Uh, and we find out uh, uh, we find out then because of this that uh, that the noise in fact is of course then um, uh, reduced by this uh, square of this this uh, uh, intrinsic noise of all this noise of the of the of the um, of the of the uh, resistor and then you can find how much power is transmitted to resistor two by just uh, uh, spectral power is uh, the, the resistance times the current squared, so the noise current squared here essentially, which is given by this simple expression here. Now you integrate over all frequencies and you find the total, total power that this resistor emits to, to resistor R2. And, and this, is, uh, this is given here. It's something which is in fact diverging integral. Of, I mean, it has this part which is like a zero point fluctuations, but they are not physical from the actual heat transport as we see in the next slide, uh, but, but the expression is, is just to integrate over the distribution of the, uh, of the uh, photons that they, it emits times the energy that they carry integrated over all energies here. So similarly, this, this resistor produces, uh, we assume that there's an independent source of noise. So these two are like uh, uncorrelated. So it's, uh, there's an independent source of noise of R2 which then uh, emits the energy to, to R1. So the total power is, the net power is P1 minus P2, or P2 minus P1, depending on how you define it. And, and when you take this uh, difference of this, changing the indices here, uh, N1, N2, R1, R2, you find that this net power here is given by this simple integral here. So the uh, ther thermal, both the distribution and both the distribution here. Doing this integral, you can do it analytically. You find that there is a power that is transmitted between the resistors, which is given by this um, simple, simple expression. So it is proportional to the difference, not to the fifth power as for the electron phonon, but second power of the two, two temperatures. And the prefactor here is something beautiful in a sense, because now if you make, well, we can, first of all, we can make the find the thermal conductance, which is the derivative of power with respect to temperature, one of the temperatures here. And, and, and at that, at in equilibrium, so we assume that then they are at the same time. So we find that this is just given by this, this expression. So now you can see some uh, two important things here. So first of all, this is maximized when the two resistors are equal. So that is the optimum case, there's all, it's like a matched case when the two resistors are the same, then this prefactor becomes one. And when this becomes one, you see that this power that this uh, resistor M is to, that the, the net power between the two is governed by the thermal conductance, which is exactly the quantum of thermal conductance. So this is a way to see that even for these uh, microwave photons, let's say the noise, the, the thermal quantum uh, conductance quantum is, is the thing that plays the role. So now you may ask a question, does it work in, in practice and under what conditions? So the first experiment uh, that we did on the, in this direction was, uh, was a, in the following setup. I don't have the actual structure here, but I have the cartoon of it here. So you have heard a lot about squids, I'm sure, in this course. 
So I don't have to introduce that for any of these experiments, I, I believe. So we have uh, resistance one, resistance two, uh, which are similar as I showed before, some small on-chip resistors. And then there are superconducting light lines, which are interrupted by, in this case, by, by squids. I think one squid would be enough, but at that time we put two of them in both of the arms. And, and what, what the squid is essentially, classically speaking, it is just an LC resonator where by the magnetic flux, you can, you can tune the Georgeson induct. If you are in the linear uh, model or linear regime, then you can say that this is the inductance of this parallel LC circuit, which is connecting these two resistors here. So, so this gives us like some flux dependent uh, uh, coupling between the two resistors. So instead of having this uh, resistance matching here, even when you have the equal resistors as we had in this experiment, you can kind of vary the coupling between the two by, by changing the magnetic flux here. So the thermal model in this case <clears throat> to describe such an experiment is like here. So you have, sorry, that the uh, one and two indices are <laughs> um, left and right uh, are not exactly the same. But uh, anyways, so if you put power to let's say resistor one, then uh, what happens is that the power is going directly to the phonon path, but then it also goes partly to, to the other resistor due to this photonic coupling. And this photonic coupling we tune by this change of this uh, inductance here. And, and now there are two different regimes. If you add high temperature, you put some power here, then the temperature, for example, this, uh, this temperature here uh, remains essentially constant at high temperature because this coupling to the phonons is strong. Remember there's this T to power five uh, dependence. So if you add high temperature, it's kind of a shunt, thermal shunt of these uh, electrons to the phonon bath. And then when you change the magnetic flux, you don't see any change in the, in the temperature of T1. If you start to lower the temperature, then uh, this one starts to become important, this channel, because this goes like T to two and this goes like T to five. So at some point with a crossover temperature around 100 millikelvin, this starts to be the dominant uh, thermal channel here. And what you see at the lowest temperatures is that as a function of magnetic flux, this temperature here is modulated as, as you have seen a lot of squid modulation pictures, but now in temperature due to the due to the opening of this, of this uh, squeeze. So, so there's a channel uh, opening here, which is this photonic channel. In this experiment, uh, when we converted this, uh, this uh, heat current, this conductance and compared it to the, to the quantum of thermal conductance, it was about one half of that, because this inductance was always, even when the squid was open, the inductance was too large to transport full thermal quantum. Later on, we uh, made experiments in, in uh, I would say, exact uh, Johnson Nyquist geometry. So we put two resistors which were directly connected to each other with a superconducting line and in a loop geometry as, as, as in Johnson Nyquist. So there's essentially, there's no heat transport by electrons here. At high temperature, there is. So, so I am not going to tell into detail anymore about what is what are this uh, what is this delta two or okay but I can tell it's a change of of this temperature with respect to the change of this temperature here. So if if this quantity is large, it means that heat is transported from one resistor to the other. So so there's there's clearly at low temperatures the two resistors start to talk to each other. The temperature of this resistor follows almost the temperature of this one. And and this uh, and the, and the, and it's very close to the thermal quantum uh, quantum conductance at which this power is transmitted between between the two. Later on, in in in, in another group, uh, the uh, in Mikko Mertens group in in also here at Alto, they made a uh, a system where they had uh, where, where they put in fact a, um, a transmission line. Between the two, which was quite quite a long transmission line. The physical distance between the resistors was only, uh, in this case, like a uh, uh, few millimeters, but uh, but the, the overall line length here was up to one meter, and they could still see the same same effect that the heat is transported by photons from one resistor to the other. Well, the question is, 
when can you see this and why, why one doesn't see that room temperature, for example? So <clears throat> heat is transported by these photons and here is the expression again for a general circuit. If you have two resistors and then there's some intermediate, uh, there's some uh, connecting impedance between them, which in this case can be reactive impedance. Or is, uh, let's assume there's just a reactive impedance composed of capacitors and inductors. Then you have the, uh, the positive distributions which tell the heat power, and then you integrate over uh, frequencies. So now, if this frequency dependent impedance is such that it cuts off the thermal uh, radiation, then of course you don't uh, achieve this uh, result that we had. However, this, if this is essentially just the resistors, then, then you reach it because then you in, in, in integrate all the photons that are created can, can reach the other, other resistor there. So the picture is that, that you have this quantum heat conductance in the case when the cutoff frequency of the circuit is much larger than the, the temperature. Then, then you are fine, you, your transmission uh, coefficient or whatever you call it, transmission is unity up to the, up to the, up to the thermal frequency. In the other case, uh, if, if, the, if the cutoff frequency of the circuit is lower than the temperature, then naturally you get some, something else. You get the classical heat transport. And, uh, and this is easy to in, take in the simple geometry like this uh, experiment uh, which we had there. If you have just the two resistors, you cannot avoid usually having some inductance and capacitance in the circuit. So if it takes us some uh, basic elements that Capacitance is uh, proportional to the length with the uh, electric constant here, or permittivity here, uh, inductance proportional to the length with this. So you find that easily that, that there are conditions when you are in the, due to these parasitic elements, when are you in the classical regime and when you are in the quantum regime. <laughs> if you just take this typical things like, let's take a room temperature, one centimeter, so macroscopic circuit at room temperature, resistance 100 ohms, as an example, you find that these conditions are, are really telling that we are deep, deep in the classical regime. So the inequalities are, are satisfied in that way. However, if you take the same resistor, put it to the 100 millikelvin, and the circuit size is 100 micrometers, you will easily, you see that this is this really, uh, uh, we are in the in this quantum regime. So you can only reach this essentially working at low temperatures and having like small circuits or maybe some sort of match, match circuits as this distributed uh, elements in this latest experiment. Okay, so now this, I, I, in fact, um, uh, I go now to the case of the, uh, of, of qubits. So I come back to the circuit that I had before which is, uh, which is this uh, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, transform circuit and then connect it to the uh, uh, resonators here. So the principle is exactly the same as before. We have two resistors, we have the qubit and, and then, uh, then we uh, um, uh, create the temperature bias and measure how much power is transmitted. So <clears throat> this can be envisioned as a circuit like here. So I, I, I had a plan to, to really do this on the whiteboard, but I think there, there's, the time will not allow it today. But you can, one, can, one can see that when you have this resistor, you have an LC oscillator, which is the resonator here. You have the qubit, which you can, uh, in, the, uh, in some regimes, you can assume that it's also an LC oscillator. It's not necessary, but one possibility is doing it that way. And then the other, other side of this circuit, you can do this calculation by exactly the same way as I did this johnson nyquist heat transport calculation, but now assuming that there is some sort of uh, LC uh, filtering of, of, of this circuit. So what happens is that, that when you change the magnetic flux, you will see that this, uh, this qubit here will uh, just have the resonance with these LC resonators uh, or at, at the side. And in, when you reach this resonance, the heat can be going through this. So there's a Lorentzian uh, transmission through this circuit for the photons when, when the three oscillators here come, come into resonance. So the picture is simple. 
you have uh, you have uh, you have essentially you have the squid or the qubit here transport qubit you have two resonators which are now identical in this case and then there's a certain coupling and then the resonators themselves are coupled to these heat reservoirs here with a certain quality factor or relaxation rate or whatever you want to uh, uh, describe it with so in the in the first case when this uh, coupling to the bath is stronger essentially than the coupling between the the element and the resonator in this case what you find out is that you have a lorentzian lorentzian uh, 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 peak or transmission of this uh, heat from this uh, structured uh, reservoir to the to the uh, quantum element so it means that when you change the magnetic flux here then twice in a flux in, in this uh, period you will hit the resonance of having the uh, the heat being able to propagate from one end to the other within this Lorentzian window and the rest of this expression is there is just uh, there's a difference of this uh, again this Bose distributions and then and then the, the um, uh, then this uh, uh, coupling essentially here which is the bottleneck for heat transport so if in, if in the experiment, what can, one can see is at different bath temperatures, you can see that the heat that we measure at the other end, which is about four millimeters away from this one, is, uh, is showing these peaks. There are like two resonances in each, uh, in each uh, period, of course, where the heat is transported. The level of the power is about femtowatt, and, and, and this is easily measurable in the, in the experiment. We can model it. Uh, with this model that we have here, and it gives us very satisfactory uh, uh, correspondence. The only fitting parameter in this case is the quality factor, which in this case was very low, like uh, three. We can also cool cool one of the resistors at the distance when we when we just apply <coughs> when we put here the voltage bias, which is corresponding to the cooling of the electron gas, so the heat is then uh, heat current is reversed. Another regime of this is that when the couplings here are uh, have a different uh, hierarchy. So when these couplings, internal couplings here are stronger than the coupling to the heat baths, then this central part here forms kind of a hybrid where the where this um, which has a multi-level structure, and then we have just a bare uh, we have just bare reservoirs or resistors which interact with this multi-level system here. And this happens, of course, when when uh, when we make the quality factors here larger. So this structure was uh, uh, diagnosed by by the standard spectroscopy, and we found the level structure of it, uh, and it shows exactly what you would get uh, by diagonalizing the Hamiltonian of these three three resonators here. <clears throat> and and from this uh, measured spectra, we can determine the parameters of this system. And we find that this, uh, this, uh, uh, we find the uh, resonance frequency, the couplings, everything from there, and asymmetry also in the system. So in this case, the heat transport is much more intricate somehow because now you don't have this Lorentzian, uh, Lorentzian filter here, but rather you have some more complicated element here in between. But still, the experimental results that we saw, we saw again the heat transport, which is modulated with magnetic flux, but in a more uh, non-trivial pattern. Uh, like, and, and again, we could model it just by this, uh, by uh, assuming that this is in the kind of the um, weak coupling uh, uh, model where, where we have the golden rule transition rates of these three, this uh, uh, hybrid system here due to the presence of the resist reservoirs. And we could see that in the model that, uh, that the features are exactly uh, are quite identical, and in this case, the quality factor was about an order of magnitude higher than in the previous experiment. So we have studied this uh, theoretically now. This crossover also uh, in a recent paper uh, uh, by uh, looking at different hierarchy of these uh, couplings and making these reservoirs into kind of forming them from the uh, harmonic oscillator bath. Another important uh, feature in this system is the <clears throat> is uh, rectification. So in this first experiment, which we had these uh, oscillators were uh, identical. So in this case, uh, it is uh, these two here 
at the same size. And, and in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, in fact, it's impossible to have heat rectification. But when you make the two re uh, uh, resonances unequal, then, then uh, heat rectification becomes uh, possible. So <clears throat> the, the idea of heat rectification is that suppose you make a, uh, if you make a temperature difference, uh, let's say put, this is hot, this is cold, you measure the heat current from left to right through this quantum element here. Uh, and then, <clears throat> then uh, uh, you reverse the temperature bias, put the same temperatures, but uh, opposite polarity. Uh, in this case, you measure again the heat current. And in this case, uh, um, in this case, uh, you can uh, you can check whether these two currents are equal or not. If they are not equal, then you say that you have rectification of heat. It's like a, a diode, not for electrical current, but for heat current. And this is something which has been studied uh, in more classical systems, uh, uh, in experiments uh, uh, in over the past years. And then there, there are a lot of theories which relate to this kind of a uh, photon system or qubit systems, uh, uh, but quite few experiments up to now. So for heat rectification, uh, what you really need is uh, are two elements. First of all, you need to have from your quantum element, you need to have coupling uh, to the uh, two reservoirs should be not the same. And this is easy to realize in our system because if you make the two resonators of different lengths, it, it naturally breaks the symmetry of, of the coupling here. <clears throat> so, and then what you have is, uh, what you need also is that uh, the that, uh, central element here is nonlinear. So, so if you have a purely harmonic oscillator here, you, you will not have any rectification, even though you would have unequal coupling from to the two paths. So you should make a really an unharmonic element here in the middle, which is what the, the qubits usually are. Unfortunately, up to now, we have been using just transform qubits in this experiment, but we are moving to other types of qubits like flux qubits together with our chairman uh, and, and local people here. And then uh, Charles qubits, which, are, which we also use now in some of the experiments. But in, in, even in, in the case of, uh, of transforms, you can have some unharmonicity. And then what you can measure is do exactly the same experiment as before, but now measure the heat from left to right and then reverse the temperature bias and measure right, heat from right to left. And what we could see immediately is that under different uh, temperature biasing conditions, the forward and reverse currents are, are unequal. So we could see this rectification and, and, and even you can see from the flux dependence of this heat current that, that even if you would have some uh, un, uh, uncertainty in the absolute calibrations of the of this of this power you can see that the, the patterns are highly uh, unlike for for the two two senses of, of of heat propagation so so if you make a ratio of these two powers and 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 normalize them properly uh, then and you can see that there is about 10 percent of heat rectification experiments are going on to try to make this much better because if you would have an ideal two level system instead of uh, this weekly unharmonic transform, you would expect really high rectification. I will not go to any detail of this expression here, but, but you can really go to the rectification which is just determined essentially by the ratio of the couplings to the two baths. Okay, so then I promised that there will be some, <clears throat> I'm exactly, I don't have more than maybe 20, 25 minutes left. So uh, I, uh, I have to uh, rush, essentially. <laughs> so if I want to present everything. So cyclic quantum refrigerator. So this is kind of our, one of our, our big uh, challenges at the moment. So what we want to do is not only to measure the steady state heat currents, but uh, to measure what happens as I showed in the beginning, when you just put a time dependent, uh, time dependent drive to the qubit and look at the uh, temperatures. In, on, still, you can measure the steady state temperatures like with a bolometer, but you put a RF drive to the qubit and you see how the heat is transported between the two resistors. And, and conceptually, you can do this in a very simple way. So you can, you can just make two LC oscillators which have different frequency as I had in this uh, previous slides uh, and then the resistors again. So exactly, this is exactly our 
conceptually, this is our previous uh, setup. And then you change the qubit level uh, separation here by, by magnetic flux, periodically, for example, by, uh, um, by magnetic flux uh, sinusoidally. And what you, what you can do is that you can adjust the amplitude and, uh, and the working point of this flux so that, that at un one end of, the, of this, uh, of this uh, cycle, you are in resonance, the qubit is in resonance with the, the, the cold res uh, resistor or cold res resonator here. And then at the other end of the cycle, you are in resonance with the hot element here or hot resonator here. So this means that you have kind of a four stroke uh, <clears throat> engine or, 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 or a refrigerator where the qubit thermalizes to the cold bath here in this first stage. Then it is decoupled from both baths when the energy separation is something in between. So we go to here. Uh, then it comes to the contact with the hot uh, bath and then the qubit relaxes. Then it again gets detached to this bath. And finally, when it reaches this, uh, reaches this uh, cold resonator, then the ground state population here is uh, transformed into some, uh, uh, some intermediate population, meaning that the qubit is tracking some heat from the hot bath, from the cold bath. So, so in, in a cycle, in a uh, cyclic process, you keep taking heat from the cold bath by exciting the qubit and then you, uh, you give it to the hot bath by relaxing the qubit. So in principle, you can expect to reach quite large cooling powers in this system and, and, that, and the simple, uh, and, and it should be linearly proportional to the frequency. This is what we got from numerically. So there is very, it's very close to the simple expression where you see the temperatures and, 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 the, uh, uh, and the energy separations of or the resonance frequencies of the two, two resonators. At higher frequencies, you can see that we expect that the power starts to have some quantum features because instead of resuming this uh, population as in this slow changes of the qubit level, the qubit starts to perform like uh, Landau Zener or let's say uh, some uh, uh, coherent oscillations. And then the population is just sort of uh, um, changing within the cycle in a way that, that you can see the minima and maxima of this cooling. Uh, uh, because uh, the conditions under which it comes to the bath are changing synchronically with the frequency. So at the moment, we are trying to realize this, in fact, with the just qubit. Uh, just qubit is, of course, not the best qubit uh, for quantum processing, but uh, information processing. But, but for our case, when we, in fact, have these uh, uh, dissipation elements here, we don't really care too much about the dissipation of the qubit. Uh, so, so we we are trying to realize it exactly in the same manner as here we as uh, that one, but now the couplings are capacitive. We have the resonators at two different frequencies, resistors as before, and then we modulate the thing with the gate voltage. So this is the current uh, realization. Of course, now it's very unharmonic. We can really address only two levels, so for sure this is good also for for some sort of diode effect. Uh, and but we have, what we found important now is that that uh, in order to isolate this just qubit, we have had to make some special filtering of this of this device. And the special filtering is exactly to make it kind of a, a semi closed system in the sense that we can even exactly transport the heat between the two reservoirs here and not letting the just qubit to relax to to for example the gate line here. And then, and we have now designed, and this will soon, uh, there will soon be a, a preprint about this. So, so we have designed kind of L, uh, T filters here, which show quite nicely that one can, one can really let the system operate at low frequencies up to two gigahertz, but then filter out the leakage to the to the at, at higher frequencies. And the spectroscopy for for these two resonators is just now done. So we have here a hot resonator, the cold resonator, which are measured now in the, uh, simultaneously with this probe here. And, and we can see that, that even uh, just qubit, as I said, it's not the best qubit, but for this experience, I think it's quite, quite okay and good. So we can see the spectroscopy for both, both of these uh, 
two uh, resonators coupled, coupled to the qubits, and we have quite uh, a strong coupling. I don't now remember exact exact number of, of the coupling, but you can see it here already uh, from the from the numbers. There is some uh, some uh, um, extra features here, probably due to the quasi particle poisoning. Okay, so now in the last part of the talk of the lecture, I, I focus on an, uh, on on colorimetry. So, Zenek, how much can I spend time on this? So you have some kind of fifteen minutes. Okay, I think it's probably it's fine. So here is a. <clears throat> So I already have told you the principle. So here is our absorber. We have the thermometer. It's this proximitized uh, uh, ZBA thermometer, as we call it, zero bias anomaly thermometer, with which we can do the measurements. And here is here is what would be connected then to the essentially to the to the qubit later on. But now what we are measuring is just to find out how good can this uh, thermometer or this uh, up, um, calorimeter be. And, and in order to assess that, one should uh, one should keep in mind that that there's always some temperature noise of such a small uh, element. Like for electrical current, also for heat current, you have the fluctuation dissipation, which tells you that there is some there is some uh, noise, and this is because you couple the system to the phonon bath, and then the heat. Uh, is uh, is uh, somehow uh, 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 statistically stochastically uh, causing changes in the effective temperature of this of this absorber here electrons in this absorber here and the fluctuation dissipation theorem for for this element for heat current is given here so we have the um, uh, already familiar quantities the thermal conductance here temperature and then then uh, the uh, spectral density of noise of heat current now at low frequencies. So it's like uh, like uh, like the uh, Johnson nucleus relation, but T is here uh, to the second power because we are talking about energy uh, energy instead of uh, particles. And then uh, then you have essentially we have the Ohm's law at low frequencies because this is what we already are familiar with, and this means that the temperature of this small element will not be constant. It will have some uh, RMS uh, fluctuations, which are given by this uh, by this uh, uh, <clears throat> spectral density at low frequencies. So it's it's increasing when the thermal conductance gets weaker. However, at the higher frequencies, it, it uh, works as an RC circuit again. So the, there's a Lorentzian cutoff of this uh, temperature noise uh, due to the to the heat capacity here. Which, which is given by this expression. So we have this uh, zero by uh, zero temperature, uh, zero frequency noise, uh, spectral density, uh, and then you divide it by this Lorentzian factor where the, where the cutoff frequency is the thermal cutoff frequency, which we already are familiar with. And then if you integrate this, you find that the RMS temperature fluctuations go like KT squared over C, so the thermal conductance doesn't play a role anymore there. So now, how can we really uh, assess these things in the experiment? We can take our favorite absorber, exactly as in the previous slide, which is naturally coupled to the phonon bath, and we put the thermometer there. And then we measure the temperature fast. Fast means that uh, on the time scale, in this case, not extremely fast, but let's say here, like 10 kilohertz or 100, 100 kilohertz uh, um, uh, sampling rate. And uh, and then of course because of this uh, of this coupling to the bath this temperature is not exactly constant. In addition, we can also put there some sort of extra uh, non-equilibrium by by injecting uh, electrons into the on the islands. I will have no time to show that now, but there are, there's in this publication which is uh, cited here we we have uh, included that that part also. But as 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 uh, uh, really, as the main results of this experiment, we were assessing this temperature noise essentially in this uh, 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 at these frequencies below this cutoff frequency, where the temperature um, uh, temperature is uh, uh, spectral density is given by this this first zero zero frequency noise noise power. And now, if if the thermal conductance is given by this electron-phonon coupling, then this uh, uh, 
uh, noise equivalent temperature, as we call it, which is the square root of this st, it is going like one over t. Uh, so, and, and that is in fact what we essentially we see. We don't, it's not uh, exactly that, but we see that at towards low, the, um, the noise is increasing. Uh, and then uh, there is kind of a uh, rounding off at, at about 30, 40 millik, uh, where this uh, noise seems to be decreasing again. And that we can phenomenologically, we can, we can just assume that there's another mechanism that takes over. So if it was only the coupling to phonons, then it would keep increasing towards lower and lower temperatures. But for example, if there is this photonic coupling, uh, as we discussed heavily in this lecture, uh, then this with certain unknown prefactor, it, if this takes over, then, then the, the uh, temperature dependence changes. It, it, it really presents some sort of maximum in the, uh, and on temperature. But I, I wouldn't kind of swear that this is the only possible explanation for, for this, uh, that it's the photons here. It can be something else as well. But nevertheless, what we have as a summary, so let's, let's zoom into this corner here. If you look at the noise of this uh, noise equivalent temperature of this absorber, we see that it's it's pretty close to what one would expect from the from the fundamental limits. So so if you take just the electron phonon coupling, this is the dashed line here is what we would expect as the as the uh, uh, lower bound for what one can read for as noise of the of the temperature. If you include there this. <clears throat> Uh, uh, photonic coupling, it, this bends over at lower temperatures, as I explained, and, and then, uh, then uh, the, 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 the actually at the lowest temperature points, which we can measure now down to almost 10 millikelvin, they, they, uh, they are really in this ballpark. So we are really reaching the, the noise of temperature, which is di dictated by this fundamental temperature fluctuations. So now the, the thing is that now we have to compare this to what one can expect as, uh, as a signal from different uh, energy photons. So, so for example, if the photon has an energy release energy of one Kelvin, then we, we expect, as I will explain a little bit more, maybe clearly uh, in, in the last part, is that, that we will have some sort of, for one Kelvin photon, we might have a, with this absorber that we had here, we might have a signal to noise ratio of about 10 to, to observe it. Observe it. So what is the projected single photon measurement? So this is already now the familiar story. So here is our absorber bath. We measure the temperature in time. And, and, and now uh, recently uh, in, uh, uh, we have uh, made a um, theoretical analysis of this, uh, of this kind of time traces of this temperature, like uh, making a Monte Carlo simulation of the, of the <clears throat> Uh, using a Langevin equation to find how the temperature uh, behaves in, in time domain. And here the temperature, time, time is scaled by this uh, thermal uh, cutoff frequency. So, so it's in, in, in this paper, this, uh, this analysis. So now what we are uh, expecting is that we couple this, uh, this absorber to the qubit. And as long as the qubit releases its energy here, it gives us, of course, this. Uh, a rise of energy, a rise of temperature. And this is the calculation done with the parameters that we had in this, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a typical uh, absorber that we now are producing. So the absorbers are made of usual metals, but they are weakly, they are proximitized by, by superconductors as, as the thermometer is there as well. So what, <clears throat> what we expect is that, that indeed the signal to noise ratio for, for in this case, the energy of the photo is one Kelvin, we can see that it's close to 10, maybe five or 10 at the moment. So <clears throat> the same simulation here, but the actual realization. So the kind of the uh, setup for the experiment is that we would initiate, initialize the qubit by, by uh, uh, in the beginning, in the simplest experiment, of course, we just excite it to the, to the excited state. And then we keep monitoring the temperature here. And as soon as the photon is emitted to, the, to this line, we can, we can absorb the energy that it, it, it uh, releases. It's kind of a dual dissipation in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this resistor that we see. It's, and it's, it's connected via this uh, resonator. And this resonator, of course, is, 
is useful because you can it, uh, by off tuning the qubit from the resonator you can you can change the like a person like um, uh, you can uh, person manually you can you can uh, you can uh, tune the relaxation rate at which the, the the photons really are absorbed in the in the in the in the absorb so in the very latest uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, analysis what we did was that we um, we have uh, been thinking about how we could still boost i mean uh, this looks relatively good of course one kelvin photon is um, is a little bit uh, 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 stretching uh, we know that in uh, aluminum typically at least uh, the qubit energies are rather in a, 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 a 0.3 kelvin 0.5 kelvin range so um, a boost in signal to noise would be quite uh, welcome and and what we have been uh, analyzing now with uh, with uh, this this kind of a, a sketch of what we have been doing uh, but uh, what we can do very concretely is that instead of having a just one absorber i think by uh, we are thinking that by uh, putting uh, two absorbers in bar parallel here like uh, <clears throat> instead of I mean, this is in practice, it's easy to realize. So you can have two of these uh, uh, absorbers which are uh, connected at the end of the same transmission line. When you measure, when you make kind of cross correlation measurement of the two temperatures, because the energy is dissipated, the, of the photon is dissipated in the two resistors, then <clears throat> you, can, you can make a cross correlation measurement of, the, of these two temperatures. And, and our analysis shows that one can, in principle, you can boost this, uh, boost the signal to noise ratio quite uh, quite uh, i would almost use word enormously in principle but uh, but of course in practice there are many limitations in this so this is this, this is what we are now experimentally uh, working on at the moment just to make a cross correlated measurement of two temperatures of, of, of in this particular setup so i think i i did quite well time wise i of course i was a little bit rushing towards the end and I didn't show this example. Uh, so uh, I, before I conclude, I just show the essentially the group uh, who has been uh, in charge of this. Uh, so uh, in the, in, especially in this, uh, uh, what is currently going on in, in this field, there's a uh, Bayern uh, uh, finishing PhD student and Yu Cheng Chang, uh, the postdoc are working on uh, Diego and uh, Asad Alberto have been uh, working on, on the quantized heat transport in general. Jonas is the senior uh, 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 scientist in the, in, in the lab. Uh, rectifier experiments were largely done by Jordan Senior. And, and uh, currently this, uh, this uh, uh, auto-refrigerator work with the just qubit is done by uh, Dimas Satria and and postdoc Andrew Guthrie, and and some of the uh, earlier measurements were done by Libin Wang on this on this uh, 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 on the on the um, heat transport, especially electron form heat transport. And maybe I should have also lifted up here Marco Mari, who did uh, this uh, fre frequency to power conversion. And you can see, find one familiar face. So Yelena was here visiting us at the time when the photo was taken. <laughs> and, and collaborators, we have several collaborators on this. Uh, not least, uh, Valeri, Alec, uh, and Zenia, and German, because we have the common, uh, common R10 project on, on, especially because we have this common project and, and I have also association to MIPT. And, and several many uh, many theorists uh, theorist collaborations from several places, and locally of course Dima Golubev whose name I think I forgot to put it here. So Dima Golubev is of course working on many of these things together with us. So I think this is all I wanted to say here. So I, I, I know I, I thank for your attention and and. Uh, I ask uh, Zenia to say what to do next. <laughs> so thank you very much on behalf of our audience. Thank you very much for very nice overview and very interesting information. 
but uh, you know we 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 decide that question should be put to chat but i don't see any oh. maybe people oh okay so now now there is a first question but maybe first of all i will ask shortly but then yeah. maybe people will write down by you can you inform me could you read the chat now or not yeah i see ah okay in this case you will answer late so my question is can you go to the slides where you talk a little bit about metrology with single electron transistor yes so uh some very short introduction from me as i know the world metrological congress said that in order to realize electrical current standard this equation should be used basically where uh, current is proportional charge multiplied to frequency yeah. because frequency is a measure which can be measured very very precisely and um, uh, so this is basic equation again for current standard my question is so i saw in the picture that current at least uh, you show this is several pico amp. Yeah. And my question is, if would be possible to to increase it because real meteorological labs they want higher current standard at uh, higher currents. I I think you know the answer. In this uh, in um, in our realization, we have pushed it up by let's say an order of magnitude up to uh, up to hundreds of pico amperes by parallelizing several of these uh, turnstiles. You can run them in parallel with the same common RF gate. So this is fully possible, but not up to currents with uh, several nanoamperes, for example. And I, I know that uh, the, there are many, uh, there are other realizations like what you, you are working on now together with Astafiev and Rasanov is this, uh, this uh, using the quantum phase lips in in uh, in um, uh, in essentially uh, the chosen effect in quantum phase lips, where you can you can really uh, reach uh, much much higher frequencies, and that that's why you can reach. Current. Yeah, but fre frequency here it could not be above one gigahertz. Okay, what well, this is my my question. So yeah. you will have some kind of non adiabatic, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, okay, okay, okay. The point. Look, you, you, uh, there is a finite tunneling rate, and and then you, you cannot if you if you start to approach the rate, the tunneling rate determined by the junction resistance, uh, then you start to lose some events. So it's it's not any more accurate at the, at this point. Okay, so thank you, Yuka. Uh, please read uh, these uh, chat questions and. Okay, I now I can't see them, but okay, let me see. Try to see again. Um, can you see it yeah yeah now i see that let me okay. see i should go to the first one what is the role of resonators in superconducting service to select desired frequencies only yeah so <clears throat> exactly i think uh, i don't know when this question came because i tried to explain that later that uh, it's important because uh, because this uh, you can uh, <clears throat> Yeah, you, essentially it is to select the desired frequencies and, and, and also to, uh, uh, to create this uh, asymmetry between uh, two different paths. It's important there. And also for, for this last part that I showed, one can do this person like detuning of the qubit with, uh, uh, if you have a resonator, you can you can really uh, study the system uh, with different uh, relaxation rates to the bath depending on the on the energy of, of the of the qubit so so essentially what you write here to select desired frequencies only so this, this is a correct answer um, then the next one in case of open systems how do you verify the correctness of the solution e.g when system is closed then one can verify by checking the values of commutation relations total energy of the system Okay, so I don't quite fully understand the question. Um, how do you verify the correctness of the solution? I think, um, uh, okay, total energy. Uh, do, do you refer to the experimental at the tests of the, when you refer to the experiment, maybe somebody can help me what, what, what this question is after. Um, By the way, which is which is this question? So, in the case of open system, or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, 
I mean, basically what we do is that uh, we, um, if we have an experiment, we try to, of course, uh, we try to see whether the <clears throat> observed, uh, for example, these flux dependencies, if you can, if the model reproduces them with realistic parameters, it's kind of standard uh, fitting procedure in that sense. Um, uh, but uh, in principle, I, of course, uh, we are working with open system models which are mainly weak coupling models. Uh, so uh, there's, of course, there are sanity checks of, uh, of uh, well, all, all relates to the, to the experimental parameters, of course. Uh, I don't, maybe the person who asked this question can, can tell uh, me. I believe that the person, uh, doesn't have microphone okay but if if no, okay. not satisfied maybe you can you can write uh, uh somehow additional to this question something but i believe your answer is yeah yes so, so it is uh, i mean it's, 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 it's essentially it's very uh, checking against the experiments yeah i believe this is how you can verify open system only experimentally what, yeah. what can you do Okay, can you share some details about the resistors nanofabrication? Which material do you use? In which voltage rates do they behave linearly? Which resistance values can you reach? Also, a reference would be helpful. Okay, this is a good practical question. We are most in many experiments, we use just very standard copper metal or gold palladium. We do it by just a standard electron beam evaporation. These are, of course, very linear in essentially any uh, voltage range, uh, but uh, uh, but then of course rather low resistance. So recently we have also used chromium. Uh, so I mean the resistances which I showed in this experience were typically a few ohms because you, you see that that your quality factor is resistance divided, uh, sorry, the 50 ohms divided by the resistance. So, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, it's kind of a, uh, uh, we should move if we have uh, quality factors in the range of uh, of uh, uh, let's say ten we we need a few ohms resistance as a termination for the for the for these uh, resonators uh, but and this is easy to realize just by elemental metals uh, then um, recently we have used quite a lot of chromium. And with chromium, you can, even with small size, you can reach resistances. Small size meaning that uh, just with uh, maybe tens of squares uh, in an evaporated film, you can reach uh, uh, kilo ohms, even tens of kilo ohms, and it's quite reproducible. So this is, uh, this is good. And they are relatively linear. Uh, there are, we don't have any reference at the moment for this. Uh, I, we are just writing up something about it, about the chromium resistors right now. And then, <clears throat> then there's, there's an old, not old, but there are, there are papers by Lotkov and Zorin from uh, PTB maybe 10 years ago where they, they, uh, they used them in, uh, in combination with, uh, with um, Cooper um, pumps, I would say. Uh, they, you, can, you can find, uh, find their papers maybe. But please look, I, I think in a, within a few months, you will have a preprint from us on the chromium. But uh, in those papers that I, I uh, uh, just uh, cited in the slides, we, we, we show how this, uh, at least the parameters of these resistors. Um, uh, okay, so what do you, the next question is from Alec Lavrin. Uh, what do you mean under TE? If it is electron temperature, isn't it close to Fermi temperature? But no, it's a, electron temperature. Is this? Uh, um, okay, I read. What do you mean under TE? Slide with these five to minus TP five. If it is electron temperature, isn't it close to Fermi temperature? About uh, about much higher than Fermi. No, no. This is the electron. It's a distribution of of electrons in the metal, so which is determined by, I mean, in equilibrium, it's the same as the phonon temperature. So you have the Fermi distribution, very sharply cut Fermi distribution if you at low path temperature. 
uh, but uh, typically, uh, and, and we usually work in the 100 millicalorie range, but then by, by manipulating, having uh, some power into it or cooling or heating, joule heating, we can, we can independently change the electron temperature. And it's, since it's weakly coupled to other temperatures, you can, you, you have quite good control of that. So, so that's, that's usual. Okay, then we have another question. In, is this a follow-up question? In closed system, it, it, total energy is saved. Commentary relation is A, A dagger is one. Yeah, so, so of course, in a closed system, you get a standard Schrodinger equation uh, results. So we, what, how we, yeah, so how we, uh, yeah, since this, person came back to this. So the open system, what we, how we really describe it is that uh, we have a multi, uh, typically if you have, a, for example, a qubit coupled to the um, resistor, uh, you often by a capacitor, what you are, uh, how you describe it is that, uh, that this qubit as a, uh, sorry, this resistor, as I told, it produces this, uh, uh, noise, which, has a, which is this emission absorption noise uh, at certain temperature, and and this noise then at the frequency of the of the of the qubit is causing the transitions in the qubit, and and the transition rate we obtain because we work in the weak coupling limit, we we obtain the transition rates by standard uh, uh, <coughs> Fermi golden rule. So so we have the we we can. From the circuit parameters, we can determine exactly the the, <clears throat> the coupling between the qubit and the resistor, uh, and uh, <clears throat> and then uh, the noise we know from the temperature and the resistor parameters. So everything we can uh, we can uh, model quite quite uh, in a simple way. So so we could um, uh, we can uh, we have several uh, references. Uh, of that, of course. So um, uh, let's let me see what would be the best uh, uh, reference to that. Uh, I mean, uh, even in this heat valve paper, which was this uh, first qubit with the with the um, um, with uh, where we uh, where we saw this uh, qubit uh, transporting heat between the this nature physics paper two thousand eighteen there. At least in the supplementary material, we explain how how to obtain the how to obtain the uh, transition rates. Uh, then um, maybe you can put to the chat some reference. There, there, you will see in a second in the chat uh, uh, Bayan who is who is here as well. He is sending you. Um, okay, this this uh, this is our this uh, qubit decay. So that there is uh, exact modeling what we do. For example, so and the, the beauty of this thing is that, uh, as you, as we all appreciate, is that we are talking about concrete, concrete uh, circuits, and we know <clears throat> exactly. Uh, it's 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 an open system where everything is uh, is uh, known very well, so we can we can model it uh, in a in a beautiful way. The challenge is, of course, like everywhere, that when you go beyond the decoupling regime, then <clears throat> things get more complicated theoretically and also from the point of view experiments. But now we are working, for example, with the uh, with, uh, uh, flux qubits where we can increase the coupling. So it's, it's just an interesting direction to go in the future to, to go well beyond the decoupling uh, models and decoupling experiments. For example, it's very difficult to to, to uh, I mean, then you can can't talk only about the system and the bath separately. You it, it, yeah. even the definitions become more more difficult in this case. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see any question. Let us thank the Yuka and Lecter Lecter again, and uh, now we have a break, and we will be back in two hours, right? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.